Hello everyone and welcome to this another episode of Game Marketing and Funding. My name is Kasanis. Guys, this is another presentation from our marketing class, the Centennial Game Marketing class. This one is from Kim from Ontario Creates, and she's going to be talking about the Fund Futures program. I hope you enjoy. Thanks everyone for sticking with us. This is Kim from Ontario Creates, who is here to present on the Fund Futures program, what it offers to indie game creators in Ontario, and then take your questions. And a little bit about like Ontario Creates in general. Okay, so uh, Miriam, just so I know, can you give me uh, some information on who's on the call, how many people we have, and sort of sure. what their contact and background is? So it's second and third year students. The second year students are in a marketing class, and we have spent the last three months learning about things like how to market a game, what a game brand is, and then for the last three weeks during this crisis, we have been learning about how game budgets work what Ontario Creates is, what CMF is, and how you take all your game market research and your product research and you turn that into things like Ontario Creates applications and how to set up a financing plan that leaves your company enough money to keep going after the game comes out and stuff like that. Okay, um, right. We sort of had to soft, the thing I didn't get much time to cover was actually like what the criteria are that Ontario Creates uses to jury, when they're jurying projects. So that would be really helpful for them to know. Okay, and I didn't, Great. I didn't get to tell them about the Fund Futures program at all, but they're very okay. comfortable with the sort of ideas of game funding. Okay, great. Yeah. Great. Okay, so that's uh, very helpful. Um, and sorry, how many people did you say we had? Just so I have an idea. There's one. I'm not counting Brian. Oh, Brian is our program coordinator, and he is recording this as well for oh. the students who are in Russia, for example, and might be a oh. Right oh, okay, excellent. All right, it's good. Well, that's good that that's happening. One, two, um, three, so four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So there's eleven students. Oh, twelve, because Stephen is here, but his icon looks like a triangle. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, so I, my name is Kim Gibson. I work at Ontario Creates. Um, I'm going to start sort of at the beginning and assume that you don't have a lot of context uh, of what the agency is. So I'll give you sort of a primer. So we are a provincial government agency that works with the entertainment industries in general. Um, within those sort of broader entertainment industries, um, the area that I specifically focus on is the interactive digital media industry. So the other industries that we deal with on Ontario Creates include film and television, so that's two, uh, book and magazine publishing, three and four, uh, the music industry is five, and then of course, uh, interactive Ontario, or sorry, uh, interactive digital media is um, is sort of saving the best for last, which is what I do. Um, my area of work with the agency is uh, on the fund side of things. So the agency does a number of different things. Uh, our biggest team within uh, Ontario creates uh, by far work on the tax credit. So we have a number of uh, media tax credits, including the Ontario Interactive Digital Media Tax Credit. So the bulk of the agency works on those uh, credits. Uh, we fund and act as a catalyst for research. So we have a business affairs and research department. Um, and then we also house uh, the province's uh, film commission. Um, and then the area that I work on are uh, the funds. And my, again, focus specifically on interactive digital media uh, and more specifically on our interactive digital media fund. Uh, we do have suites of programs similar to the interactive digital media fund for all of the industries that we serve, but I'm not going to get into that because it's not uh, of interest and uh, relevant to uh, you folks. Uh, so my area within the fund is exclus exclusively dealing with games. So the interactive digital media industry from the perspective on, of Ontario Creates is broader. It's more than just video games. Um, so uh, we deal with all kinds of different content creators within the IDM fund, uh, web series producers, um, e-learning content creators, uh, people who are creating XR uh, experiences, anything kind of under the sun. So it's anything that is ultimately 
uh, distributable on an interactive platform network or device. That is what we would relate to through our interactive digital media fund. The fund has a number of different programs. Uh, the biggest ones by far are our concept definition and production programs where we actually fund product development. We also do other things. So we have other types of programs that we fund or other types of programs that we offer as part of the interactive digital media fund. Uh, we fund international business uh, development through our global market development program. Uh, we fund marketing for uh, projects that we have funded through uh, our production stream. Uh, so uh, companies that have been successful with production can come to us and get a top up for uh, marketing dollars to uh, market the project that we've supported. Um, and then um, we also fund third party events and organizations and things that are happening in the industry that help to grow the industry in general. So uh, we fund things like Canada Society's event events, uh, Interactive Ontario, um, on sort of the non-gaming side, there's a group called the Inter uh, uh, Web Series Creators of Canada, so we fund uh, their types of activities. Um, they have a conference that they run once a year. Again, probably not something that's relevant to you because we have no Web Series producers on the call, I'm assuming, it's all game people. Um, but we do fund those things uh, third party. And then, so the other thing I think that Miriam wants me to talk about is the Futures Program. So that's the one program that I haven't sort of touched on. Um, the Futures Program is was set up specifically because what we found is that there were lots of people who had really great ideas for games, but not necessarily the experience. Um, in order to execute on those ideas um, or in order to be able to come into the program and be successful. So we do have a minimum, um, I guess, experience requirement in uh, the product fund, so in concept definition and uh, production programs. Uh, we have a minimum level of experience that we, we uh, need to see in order for your company to be considered eligible. Um, it's based on if you're an existing company, revenue and expenditures. Um, and then if you're a new company, we lo are looking exclusively at your track record. But what that means is that companies that are being started up by individuals who are recently entering the workforce, i.e. just finished a post-secondary uh, educational program, are not eligible for uh, the IBM fund. And there's lots of reasons why. One is because the challenges that you're facing are different than some of the challenges that we see for more established companies. Um, we really don't have the capacity to kind of roll up our sleeves and get down and, and, and help because we're so busy and the team is so small, we're so busy um, running uh, the actual funds that we don't actually have time to provide advice. That's not what concept definition and production are for. That being said, we did realize that there was a demand and a need, um, and it didn't seem to fit within our concept definition uh, and production program. So we set up this program called IDM Fund Futures. And IDM Fund Futures is explicitly targeted at either companies that are new to the interactive digital media industry. So say a company coming from an experienced company coming from the film and TV world that doesn't necessarily have experience with interactive production may want to try their hand at making some kind of a game. Um, and then it's also targeted at individuals who are coming to interactive um, that are new to the industry. So recent graduates who may be just coming out of a post-secondary educational institution and uh, they have an idea for a game, uh, but maybe we need a little bit more support than what we're able to offer in concept definition and production. So Futures um, is a program that we came up with that we devised, but it is a program that we are somewhat hands-off with. So it's what we call an alternate service delivery model. Again, because we just don't have the capacity to run a program of this nature on our own. We just don't have the, 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 the bandwidth internally to do that. So what we have done is in, in the past and what we will do going forward uh, is we work with industry associations, again, third party groups that support the industry. Uh, and we, we give them an opportunity to come in and submit an idea for a program to us. If we like the program, then we basically hire them on to uh, deliver that program under our IDM Fund Futures um, banner. So in the past, we have worked with uh, Hand-Eye Society. Uh, we have worked with Interactive Ontario, uh, both of which have 
focused primarily on the video game space. Um, and then we have also worked with Women in Film and Television Toronto, who have run a similar program, uh, IDM Fun Future Style program for uh, people who are new to web series creation and web series uh, production. Uh, so uh, those programs uh, vary. We uh, don't determine what exactly it is that is being offered in the program. We don't go out and hire the, the kind of guest speakers and we don't prepare the curriculum. That is all done by the organization that we have hired to basically deliver uh, the program. So if, um, if you, th there's a lot of variety in the way those programs are offered. So some of the organizations will offer them on weekends, some of them offer them weekday nights, some of them offer them on weekdays, sometimes they go over six weeks, sometimes it's a condensed weekend. So it's ultimately up to the organization uh, that is running the program to determine the best possible structure for that particular program and for their particular kind of uh, um, target that they're, they're looking to reach out to. So there's a lot of variety uh, there. If you're not available on weekends and you're only available on uh, evenings, vice versa. So you can pick and choose a little bit which program uh, works best. But ultimately, the intent of the program across all of the organizations that we're working with is that they help or participating to get up to speed so that they are in a position to come in with a successful funding application uh, to uh, the IDM fund, either concept definition uh, or production program. So uh, they bring you a sort of a, uh, an accelerator, so to speak. Uh, the other thing that is um, a benefit, so in addition to sort of giving you access to knowledge and information, um, and uh, you know a bit of a, a sort of a primer on on interactive and how to run a company. Um, the other thing that happens at the end of the IDM for Futures program is we automatically consider people who are futures graduates eligible for the IDM fund. So it's a fast track to eligibility. So when you graduate from school right now from this program, you may not have any industry experience. If you were going to uh, want to come into us for support for through our interactive digital media fund, we require that you have at least three years of professional experience. So instead of waiting those three years uh, uh, to get the professional sort of industry experience, this program will help you to fast track. So you can do it as soon as the, the program is, o is over. So we usually run the program in and around the fall. Uh, so it kind of runs September, October, November, uh, December. And then uh, the idea is that uh, companies and individuals that have participated are in a position to come in with an application in the spring if they so choose. The other thing that we do with the IDM Fund Futures program is in addition to having a training component um, and in addition to making you eligible for our interactive digital media fund, it also, um, uh, there's also a small grant that you can access. So, and that grant varies from year over year, but it's a small amount of funding that you can use to sort of help you on your next steps. So you may have a very uh, small game. I've seen some people come in um, and, take their project almost all the way through to production with a small uh, $15,000 grant, um, or you can come in and work on a prototype, or you can do business and marketing planning. Um, it's ultimately up to you what you want to do that money for. It, it, use that money for. It is competitive, so you do need to file an application, and there are limited numbers. So usually I'd say about a quarter of the companies that apply, we have funding to, uh, to fund their activities for about a, a quarter of them. So, um, I'm going to pause there because I think we wanted to leave time for questions that I think we have exactly 15 minutes, which is what we wanted to do. Right, Miriam? Yes. Perfect. You've done it. Mm. Uh, does Great. Anybody have, does anybody have any questions? No okay. question is, is too big or too small or no. dumb. I don't believe in stupid questions. Okay. Arshi has a question. No. Yes. I see my, typing. my question is, how are you coping with your, uh, with your self-isolation? How's everything going? You know what? It's okay. It's up and down. Um, yeah. And I'm sure that's the same for everybody. Um, I've had some challenges sort of keep, I'm not used to working at home. We are not a, a work remote office, so it has mm. been pretty challenging, but I'm up to speed uh, now. And I feel like I'm kind of starting to get things done. Um, and kind of starting to kind of pick up my productivity a, a little bit. <laughs> um, 
but uh, it, it was it was a little bit a little daunting because uh, I was away before it happened, so I was on vacation for a week. Yes, I was one of the lucky few that got a vacation and before this happened. I got a vacation, I landed, I was in the office for a week, and then I was told to go home. Yeah, yeah. and I was like, whoa. So <laughs> it's, uh, and I'm not set up to work from home. I don't have a desk. Um, uh, my husband is here. We have a dog and three cats. So oh, it's God. a little bit of madness. Um, but it's, you know what, we're, we're all right. How about yourself, Marion? It's been okay. I mean, it's been... Uh... I'm sad about missing all of the the March conference season. I didn't think I would be, but uh, I am. So that's been interesting to acknowledge. I'm sad too, and I'm sad to see that it's not just the in March season. It looks like it's going yeah, into the summer, and it looks like they're canceling Gamescom or moving it to an online format. Uh, yeah. So it is really, um, really sad. Oh, Archie, you don't have a question? Or you do have a question? No, Kyle Just... had a Kyle had a question, and the question is, how long have you been working with content creators? Oh gosh! Um, <laughs> oh my god, I'm embarrassed. Um, I've been there for twenty years. Wow. So I started um, when I was five. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, I started. Um, Pretty soon after I, I had a couple of jobs and I started pretty soon after I um, left my, I did two degrees after I did my second degree. Um, and uh, it was a, uh, yeah, I just, I never looked back. So it's been a really interesting experience because when I started, I, I got to see an awful lot that I think most people don't really have insight into because when I started, there were no, um, feature phones, so like smart right. smartphones that didn't exist. Um, those sort of old school, like with like the kind of J two M E brew phones, and people were developing games on those formats. Um, I was there when that was happening, so um, I've seen a lot. Um, I've watched the industry change, um, and it's been really, really interesting. When I started, uh, that was when Ontario Creates at the time was called. Actually, I was going to call it State Ontario Media Development Corporation, but it wasn't even called Ontario Media Development Corporation at that time. It was the Ontario Film Development Corporation. And oh, we cool. just started working on uh, the interactive industry, and I was brought in to, uh, to work with that. So, yeah. Cool. What do you think is the biggest... Oh, wait, Archie yeah. has a question. So read Archie's question first, and then I'll ask you my question. Oh, where... Oh, I'm not seeing Archie's question. Oh, um, if oh, you go oh, into... Oh, I'm not, I didn't go, go scroll all the way down. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, uh, when new applications will begin? That's a great uh, question. Uh, I hope it's not going to be. I, it's not. We are moving ahead business as usual. So despite the fact that I'm having personal struggles because I don't have a desk, uh, <laughs> we are moving ahead. Um, and uh, and we are, um, we are going to sort of roll out programs as we normally would. So I imagine that it will happen in the fall, uh, probably in and around September, I would I would look for. Um, the other thing is if people are interested, you can sign up to be added to our distribution list. So if you go onto our website, there should be somewhere there a sign up uh, form. I'll so you can up. sign up to get, yeah, to get updates on the interactive digital media industry. And then I see other questions. If the whole team consists of new graduates, would it be in our best interest for all of us to join that program or would one be enough? How much of a difference would that make for the 15% grading scheme for the eligibility uh, decision criteria? Okay, um, and sorry, actually, Miriam, you did explicitly ask me to talk about evaluation and I didn't, so I will step, I'll take this opportunity to do that as well. Um, so um, so I guess it would, I guess it would depend. So what we would be looking for would be, um, if you were coming out of your program and you wanted, you had the intent of starting up a company, I would say we would want to see the principles of the company. And we have had situations where there has been more than one team, or sorry, one, more than one person on a team that has participated. So we've had like two representatives from the company in some of the programs. So that is, that's, that's fine. So um, I would say applying together, but applying with the intent to sort of form 
a company because that's ultimately what we what we are doing. So one of the things to remember about Ontario Creates is that while we are funding products, funding products is not the ultimate goal of the agency. Our goal is actually to benefit, create benefit to the Ontario economy. So the project is a means to an end. We fund projects in order to grow companies and we want those companies to grow and expand because they create jobs uh, for Ontario residents. So I would say that if you're planning on coming in and there's a group of you, I would say come in as that group, but with uh, presented as a company. So don't uh, apply as um, as individuals. Um, and when you're talking about the grading scheme, so I'll just give a really quick sort of rundown of what we are looking at for evaluating projects. Uh, we're looking at your track record. That's one of the things that's worth 15%. Um, and I'll come back to what that impact is on having participated in the IDM Fund Future on that score momentarily, but I'll just go through the sort of, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to go through the percentages. Um, you can find those all in the, the guidelines, but I'll just walk through each of the sort of main criteria that we're looking at. Uh, track record is one of them. Um, we are looking at benefits to the Ontario economy. So are you able to, as a result of getting funding, will you be able to grow your company? Will you be able to um, uh, create jobs and employment for the Ontario Ontario residents? Um, we're looking at feasibility. Is the budget accurate? Is the schedule reasonable? Are you able to do what you say that you're going to do? We look at the creative strength of the project. Is it an interesting, unique, creative project? Will it resonate with an audience? And then we also look at market potential and commercial sort of viability. So does this project have a likelihood of achieving a positive return on investment? So those are the kind of the, the five main things that we look at that are part of the sort of main evaluation criteria. We also recently in the last couple of years have focused very much on um, diversity. And uh, so we had, there's a bonus points assigned for projects and or companies that reflect diversity. So you will need to put a statement in your application explaining how the project reflects diversity, explaining your company's view and values towards uh, diversity. Um, and then we evaluate what you've written and, and make that um, uh, make that sort of note. Thank you for posting all of these things. That's great. Um, so with respect to how being in IDM Fund Futures affects your um, your sort of evaluation and that for, first sort of track record of 15 points, um, the, the reality is that it is going to help. However, the IDM Fund is oversubscribed and extremely competitive and it is, you are still going to be competing with um, the best of the best in the province. So I'm talking about the Drinkbox Studios, I'm talking about the Capybara Games, I'm talking about the Big Viking Games. Um, you can, so the large development studios are also submitting applications to our program and they are your competition. And uh, the bar is the same in the program that, that we're measuring everybody at the same level. So you will likely score lower in the 15% than those other companies do, um, but you would score higher having gone through IDM Fund Futures than if you had at least, and also in going through IDM Fund Futures, it at least gets you in the door. So um, and the other thing just to say is that we have seen uh, many uh, or, or a number of companies come into uh, concept definition specifically I don't know if we've successfully funded a futures graduate in production, but we have funded them in concept definition. So uh, it is possible to receive the support. And uh, the decision criteria, we uh, use an industry jury. So the way our decision criteria, or the way our decisions are made, once the applications come in, we review them for eligibility and completeness. Those applications that are eligible and complete are passed along to what we call an industry expert because we see so many different types of projects, web series, e-learning projects, games. Um, not everybody can be an expert in all things. So uh, we do have experts do a quick review through the every project. Um, so if you're uh, coming up with a game, we'll assign your project to a games industry expert who will prepare a written assessment. Um, that assessment, along with the full application, is provided to our industry jury and reviewed, um, and that assessment is there for them to help them um, make their, their their scores. So, yes. Um, okay, and then there are other questions. Is that, I'm hoping that made sense. Does that make sense, Marion? Yeah, I'm just trying to make notes of it. So, like, let me see if I got this right. The, the jury is, there's an industry jury, but then you take the complete applications, we send that to an expert reviewer, and then that reviewer makes some notes, and then it gets passed to the jury. 
the, along with the notes. So the jury, yeah. if they're not, say, a games industry expert and don't have, oh, I don't know much about, like, VR gaming, they have somebody who does, who's kind of mm-hmm. given them some context. They can okay. disagree with that person. They can agree with that person, but it's just a perspective that they can use as part of their evaluation. Got it. Okay. So, um, and then question, is the fund strictly for Bonafide uh, Ontario residents or can students in Ontario on a student visa or work visa um you would need to be the company needs to be canadian owned and controlled and ontario based so i we would need to sort of take that offline um and i would say that would be the same for both uh futures and the sort of concept definition and production uh program so student visa definitely not we'd have to look at the ownership requirements what if the company was owned, majority owned by a Canadian people in the company that had some equity Canadian? Yes. Yeah. Like if they're, okay. yes. Yeah. So, I mean, Canadian owned there, it's a, it's very nuanced and there are all kinds of sort of little niggly things. We would have to look at it. If, if there was a, you know, a, if, um, Brian, if, uh, one of the, the individuals, was sort of, it was a team of four and it was, you know, uh, 75% Canadian owned uh, would likely be fine. Awesome. Uh, I thought there was another question up here. Oh yeah. Uh, I had the question. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, My question was, since you, it kind of built off Kyle's question, Uh, since you have been at Ontario Creates for such a long time. What do you think has been the biggest shift aside from like in terms of actual games, not necessarily devices, but what has changed the most in the last 20 years in terms of the portfolio? Oh, oh gosh. I would say the big, the thing that's had the biggest impact on my job and what I do. Uh, and I think the industry in general is digital distribution. Mm. So going digital um, and the the changes, the impact of that is still being felt. And it it's we tend to the industry is sort of a little bit of a, a pendulum. So when I started, um, beyond just the fact that there were no smartphones and we, there were just feature phones, uh, when I started, there was no um, there was no way to release a game without a publisher. So um, we were constantly, like there was an absolutely no way that those, the slots that were on sort of um, like even, even digital slots um, that were on sort of storefronts, you had to have a publisher and they were doled out by the platforms. Like Xbox would give a publisher, yeah. oh, you have five slots and you know, Sony would give a publisher, you have like 10 slots or whatever. So they would dole them out to publishers and publishers would, lord over them and make them available to developers as they saw fit so and then that opened up and things changed and developers all of a sudden had the opportunity to self-publish which i think everybody sort of rushed to uh to do that because it's like oh great like i don't have to give my back end to this awful publisher i get to keep all the revenues Uh, but then what ends up happening is the stores get flooded and now we have a uh, problem with discoverability. Um, and then the other thing I think that developers started realizing is that developers like to make games. They don't necessarily like to market them. Um, mm-hmm. And they realized that they weren't necessarily experts in that. So a lot of companies struggled um, with that. Um, and now what I'm seeing again is when I talk about the pendulum, we've sort of gone all the way from like publisher to self-publishing. Now we're kind of starting to swing back and um, from my perspective what I'm trying to what I'm actually starting to see are a lot more publishers interested in working with developers and developers interested in working with publishers I think it's a more equitable and balanced relationship now um, or at least it can be it's not always you have to be smart when you're negotiating uh, terms of your agreement but um, yeah there's lots of um, lots of that happening now I am um, I'm routinely approached by publishers who are looking for games and they come to me and say oh you know do you have a do you have a game like 
give me really good things we can look at. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's an it's an interesting situation. So it's it's changed a lot. I'd say the other thing that really affected us was the switch from uh, to freemium style games, like not just not premium uh, stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's really changed the industry as well. But again, that is largely associated and because of digital distribution. Yes, it's an interesting industry. I look forward to seeing see what happens in the next 20 years. <laughs> uh Oh, oh, I think we're over the end of your time. Darn it. Uh, I was going to ask you another question. But... Oh, go for it. Absolutely go for it. Yeah, I'm fine. Uh, I guess my question is, so the fund futures thing seems like a great opportunity for, for new grads or for new business developers. Oh, I think Will has a question. Will, do you have a question? Okay, let's do it. Do you want to ask me yours and then I can get Will's afterwards? Yeah, but if mine comes in, yeah. and then and like, just answer Will's. Uh, my question was just going to be like, to a student, would you recommend going out for a publisher with their first game as opposed to self-publishing as a way to avoid having to learn? I would that recommend doing whatever they they can to get their game done. <laughs> I, I, I mean, honestly, it is lean and it is mean out there. Uh, many, many years ago, somebody said to me, why would you go and start your first your own company when you graduate from school? Because you're going to make tons of mistakes. Go get paid working for somebody else to make those mistakes. And there's and there's some truth to that. So um, it is a it is a challenging, tough industry. I don't want to be I don't want to discourage you from going that route. But there is also nothing wrong with working somewhere, building up your skills, building up your knowledge, um, because there's lots that you'll you'll need to learn in order to sort of be successful in the industry. So why not get paid to do it? Um, but if you do have that opportunity to get a game out, then go for it. And um, I would I would just do anything you can to get something released. I wouldn't, uh, you know, it's it's tough and it's it's mean out there. So, I mean, a publisher would probably help, but the challenge is you're unproven. So, in some cases, the publisher may not be interested or willing to to work with you. Um, and sorry, Will's question: uh, To grow the economy of five jobs, does this mean you greatly favor larger teams over smaller teams? Uh, that's a really good question, Will. Uh, to some extent, yes, it's part of the uh, evaluation, but it's not the only thing that we look at. So the balance, there's a kind of multiple different things going on with our evaluation criteria. So uh, we have had very small, small teams, like two people teams, one person development teams come into us with really amazing, interesting, creative ideas and they score, the score reflects their their sort of superior creative vision or they've got a really lean and mean budget and the project looks like it's going to generate revenue and then the company's going to grow so it's it's part of the evaluation um all things being equal yes we would take a a, a company or a project that was bigger that was creating more jobs but all things are never equal i saw thought i saw someone else typing yeah. Was there a question? I don't know. I thought Archie might have one. Oh, you're, you're, you're 10 minutes away from Shelly's coming from the CMF. Is there anything you oh. want? <laughs> I know. That was great. I love Shelly. She's awesome. <laughs> Is there anything that we should think to ask the CMF person based on, on the Ontario Creates? Like, are there things that the two funds relate in any way? Uh, you know what, she could, I, I won't talk about it because we're kind of out of time, but she could maybe talk about some of the things that are different between our funds because they okay. are not identical. Um, we do talk to each other, of course, and I know Shelly super well, um, and we do chat very quite regularly. Um, so yeah, it's, um, yeah, she, and she knows our program and I know their program a little bit, but yeah, she can speak a little bit, ask her to speak a little bit about the differences. Because okay. they are different programs and they have different evaluation criteria. So one of the things to point out is, you know, and and um, Will, you kind of picked up on that with your question about growing the economy. Um, 
they don't have that objective. So their objective is different than what we're looking to do. We're looking to do. So um, in some cases, we will find ourselves funding different projects. So just because you're successful with CMF doesn't mean you're going to be successful with Ontario Creates and, and vice versa. So we do often fund, co-fund things, but we also sometimes prioritize things a little bit differently. Awesome. Okay, well, I see Brian and Archie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more questions. Are you playing Animal Crossing, Kim? Are you an Animal Crossing person? I am embarrassed to tell you that I have spent 150 hours on it. <laughs> That's amazing. Yep, I have unlocked terraforming and I am building waterfalls everywhere. Um, I am also, it's been really lovely for me because I have two beautiful nieces and I don't, I miss them horribly. Um, every year I run a little Easter egg, uh, contest for them and I, um, I wasn't able to do that this year. So I went into my uh, niece's island and Aww. I did a bunch of things for her there. So, um, yeah, it was, um, it was, a, it's been a lovely experience playing the game. Uh, it's really kind of been the one highlight over the last couple of weeks is having that game. It's made, it's made this whole social isolation a little bit more bearable. And then we have a question from Archie. Having an investor as part of the board affect the grading greatly, even if the rest of the team doesn't have the required experience? Um, yeah, it can make a difference. Um, having them as part of the board, um, again, it also depends on whether how much experience they have in the industry. Have they released product? How involved are they in the 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 company and in the sort of day to day operations? Are they actively involved? Uh, you know, boards can sometimes just be figureheads and they're not that um, engaged. Um, I would say that you maybe don't even need to go to the, that far or to the point of putting them on the, on the board. I'd say having a mentor helps. So have a mentor um, and, uh, and make them part of the team um, and include them in the actual proposal. Mm. Is there a system for including mentors in the proposal, Kim? Um, <laughs> well, what I would say. <laughs> what I would recommend is just you can you can put them like, just to keep them actively involved. Um, you can give them uh, put them in the budget somewhere in some kind of a, a line item and a role if they're what their sort of sort of standard role is. Um, you can give them a small stipend out of the budget, or they might just be prepared to kind of turn around and donate their time to your project as well. So you could reflect their donation in the financing plan. And is it more normal for them to have a role like producer or? Like, do they have to be part of the senior team to reflect better on the application? Um, I'd say not necessarily part of the senior team, but we want we would want to see that they're actively supporting you. So I would say if okay. you have a mentor and somebody who's really keen in like helping you out and they really do genuinely want to help you out, um, also see if they can give you a letter of support. Okay. Some kind of, something in there that basically says, yeah, I'm prepared to, you know, I believe in this project. I believe in this team. I am prepared to work with this team for, you know, and give them donate 10 hours a week of my time or whatever, 10 hours a month, 10 hours a week is a lot of time. Um, 10 hours a month. So yes, that can help. It is not going to make the difference of whether you do or don't get funding. Um, again, all things being equal, it would make the difference, but there's a lot of variables at play. So just because you have that in that letter doesn't mean you'll have a successful application, but still it's a good thing to have. Okay. That's great. Um, Excellent. 